So, ja. dann sagen Sie Bescheid. Ja, guten Morgen. Uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from the German residents in The Hague, uh, the Netherlands. And uh, this is uh, an, a seminar or uh, an exchange of views on uh, populism in both countries, Germany and the Netherlands. And I'm very happy that we can do this this morning together with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels, uh, that is to say. And on that score, I welcome the presence of the, the head of the Brussels office of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, Mr. Ostry, and his colleague, Mr. Gläser. And we will be joined for this event this morning by René Couperus, here with me in the German residence uh, from Klingendal, and by Mrs. Fischlage from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Berlin. So we are working in a bit of a triangle here. Uh, I can tell you that it was not too easy to set that up technically. I think we were still experiencing uh, sound uh, shakes be just a second before we got started, but I think we are now doing okay. And in that respect, I'm very pleased to be able to, to get us going. As I said, populism and the role of populist parties in both of our countries and in, in Europe uh, as a whole, if you want. And uh, I think with this, I would actually like to give the floor to our Gastgeber, as we say in German, in terms of the organization of this event, which is the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels, Dr. Ostri. So, Dr. Ostri, the floor is yours, and thank you for doing this. Yeah, the Ambassador Brengelmann, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, also on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, I would like to extend to all of you a warm welcome from the European office here in, in Brussels. From here, we are following all the developments on the European level, but also the political situation in Belgium, the Netherlands, and in Luxembourg. And therefore, we are particularly happy to co-host this event today with the German Embassy in The Hague, and especially thanks to Ambassador Brengelmann for this cooperation. I'm very much delighted to have our colleague Franziska Fisslage with us, and also with Akuberos. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor back to Ambassador Prengelmann, who is moderating the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ostrich, thank you very much. And uh, with me today is a good expert on anything uh, happening between the Netherlands and, and Germany, uh, René Couperos. I think uh, most of you will, will know him. He's also an extensive uh, writer and author. He's a, yeah, uh, a scientist, so to say, ein Forscher at Klingenthal. Uh, which is a well-known institute here in The Hague. Uh, they also do actually the diplomatic schooling for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in The Hague. And um, we have had, uh, uh, to, uh, to be honest on this, we have had already before some events where René Couperos would uh, present us the Dutch view. And I can tell you it's particularly interesting when you hear René uh, talk about our country from a, a Dutch perspective because Yes, he has a different angle of looking at us, and it is always quite interesting to get him talk about differences or commonalities. And today he is doing that, uh, as we said before, on the role of populist parties, on the rise of populism in our countries and in Europe. And with this, I will give the floor to René Couperos. Frau Fischlager will come after that, uh, yeah? after okay. you. Okay, fine with me. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, sehr geehrter Herr Botschafter, Ambassador Brengelmann, thank you very much for inviting me to the beautiful German residence. It's a great honor to speak at this great online event organized by your embassy and by the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. I'm glad to be able to give my impulse, impulse referat, my presentation here at this beautiful German residents in The Hague, that's much better and much more inspirational than being at home alone in my study. Uh, it's much better to be here. The topic of today remains urgent and worries me already for some time. It is about the worldwide revolt of populism against the establishment. 
It's about the fragmentation of the post-war people's parties. And it's about the polarization of our European middle-class society. And I want to make four arguments about the topic of this webinar. First of all, before we start to discuss individual parties or politicians of the populist tribe, we should acknowledge and realize that populism is a reaction. Populism is a reaction to deep changes in our society, in our economy, and in our political system. First of all, populism can be defined as the revolt of the left behind, of neglected regions, of neglected cities, and neglected people. Populism is a complex revolt of anger, frustration, and resentment against the establishment. And part of it is the revenge of the places that don't matter anymore, which is the revolt of the periphery. Look at Eastern Germany, look at the Rust Belt in the US, USA, look at the rundown industrial areas in the north and east in France, the biotope of Marine Le Pen, look at Limburg and Oost Groningen in the Netherlands. Many people experience a lack of respect, a lack of attention by, mainstream, by mainstream, mainstream society, which is dominated more than before by booming global cities and by the values and opinions of academic professionals, which are the winners of global modernization. As a matter of fact, exactly Konrad Adenauer understood the danger of rapid unguided change. Keine Experimente was his famous motto after the apocalyptic turmoil of the Second World War. Change is causing winners and losers, those who can adapt easily or profit from change, and those who cannot adapt or profit. Our society, our economy have changed dramatically over the last decades. Keywords or Stichworte, globalization, knowledge-based economy, migration, and climate change. And populism is a revolt against rapid change, anti-elite, anti-establishment, but also scapegoating migrants and the EU. But also populism is a reaction against political correctness of the mainstream, a reaction to ill-managed migration and integration. Think about the beheaded teacher in France. However, there's also a dangerous xenophobic and anti-democratic tendency in populism as analyzed by Jan Werner Müller. By claiming that populists represent the people, wir sind das Volk, they tend to see everyone who disagrees with them as an enemy of the people. That's a threat to democracy and the rule of law. My second observation, what worries me is the potential backlash of the corona crisis in a polarizing society. The hostile division in the USA between the red and the blue tribe, between the coasts and the middle, middle America is an extreme case, but also in Europe, we tend to move into that, 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 that direction, becoming highly polarized societies between the liberal establishment on the one hand and the populist outsider anti-establishment camp at the other hand. In fact, there are in every country two parties today. Our society is dangerously divided in about two halves. 50% versus 50%. The mainstream establishment versus the outsider populist anti-establishment. Look at France, Macron and Le Pen. Look at the USA, Trump versus Dem Democrats. Look at the presidential elections in Austria some years ago, Green versus Brown. No center anymore at present. Look in the Netherlands between the governing coalition conglomerate and the outsider or protest parties. So in every country in, in, in Europe, there are more or less two party camps. And this is a dangerous warning not to get into the direction of the USA. It's not clear yet how the corona pandemic plays out here. The COVID crisis can be a chance to reconcile these two camps, but it can also worsen the divides in our society. Good signs could be the return of government protection governments spending loads of money to small companies and to employees in Germany and the Netherlands. A good sign could also be the discussion about the end of neoliberal market globalization, 
or even the return of community spirit against individualism in the corona crisis. But the COVID crisis could also deepen cleavages, causing new inequalities and multicultural tensions, especially when a government cannot uphold its promise of protection. And we end up in a severe economic and social crisis. Then we have state failure instead of state protection. How to maintain the social contract of our post-war welfare state and liberal democracy in the COVID crisis? That's the key question for me. And all depends on rather fragile center parties, CDU in Germany and VVD in the Netherlands. All depends on these fragile center parties. Are they able to reconcile and bridge the divisions in our society? Third remark. On the face of it, populism seems at the moment not a big political threat. AFD in Germany has remained Aussie populism. There's no real breakthrough has taken no place in Germany as Wessi populism. And internal fights within AFD are killing the momentum for AFD. In Holland, the Forum for Democracy, the big winner of the regional elections is doing very bad in the polls. Its leader, Thierry Baudet, is disputed in his own party and is failing the corona crisis. But at the same time, the PVV, the Freedom's Party of Geert Wilders, is back as second biggest, biggest party in the polls, being very active in parliamentary debate. What we witness, and that's, I think, important to, to mention, we are, we are we're dealing with two flavors of establishment, anti-establishment populism. On the one hand, we have a populism based on marginalization and deprivation, Aussie populism. But on the other hand, we have a movement, a national conservative Christian counter movement to the liberal mainstream. There's something completely different. There are two flavors of populism, Aussie populism and a national conservative Christian movement against the establishment. In Holland, here we could distinguish between PVV of Wilders and the FVD of Baudet. PVV is populism for the low educated periphery. But the Forum for Democracy is national conservatism for higher educated. The party of Baudet is financially supported by rich Christian entrepreneurs to change the liberal cosmopolitan course of society. And in a way, we, we could find that originally in AFD as well. AFD started by Professor Luke as a national conservative movement against the Euro, Euro and has transformed into an extreme right right-wing populist party, but in, in the beginning, this element of national conservatism was also within IFD. Talking about Western Germany, I think it's important to mention, and I'm nearly there, that Western Germany seems to be less prone to populism. And there are some reasons for that. In, in Germany, different from France or the UK or the Netherlands in a bit, you don't have these tensions between a center, strong center and the periphery because you have this, all these major cities. It's not Berlin versus the rest, like in Vienna or London or Paris. You are more divided, your power, the city power is more divided in Germany. So there's not this, this, there's not this strong center periphery tensions like in other countries like the UK and France. Also you have in Germany, what I call Länderstolz. You have very strong regional pride in Germany, which is different from a lot of other countries. There's a lot of lender stolz in Germany, which is very different from UK or France. Germany is also less post-industrial than other countries. There's, the industry is still survived in Germany, especially small companies. You are an engineer's economy. And what's very important, you have stolz auf Facharbeit still. You, there is pride for manual labor, for low-skilled labor, which has lost in the Netherlands, but you still have this Stolz for Facharbeit, which is completely different and very German. And this is a blockade for populism to rise because populism is also about disrespect for manual labor by academic professionals. And you don't have that still in Germany. Can, can be there in 10 years time, but still you are different from other countries, I think, in this respect. Mm -hmm. My fourth observation, populism and political fragmentation. Well, I, I forgot what's the bad news about Germany. The good news is you are less prone for, to, to periphery populism. The bad news about Germany is you have, different from the Netherlands or Scandinavia, you have a neo-Nazi extreme right milieu. 
which is gewaltsbereit, violent. You also have violent anti-fascists. So you also have a, a connection between your populist party and this brown milieu, which is not existing in the Netherlands in this, in this way. Yet that makes populism in Germany still more dangerous than in other, other countries. This connection to gewaltsbereit neo-Nazi milieus, especially in Eastern Germany. I forgot to say that. But my fourth observation is about populism and political fragmentation. They are related. The more traditional parties lose their ideology, the more traditional parties lose their profile because they end up in grand coalitions, Rosa Coalitions, dissolving the left right divide and become one big political cartel, like in Holland, the Purple Coalitions, like in Germany, the Rosa Coalition. This dissolving the left right divide, then there's more space for populist oppose, opposition and protest, for alternative. And one could say that today, both in Germany and the Netherlands, the mainstream establishment is a compromise between economic liberalism and cultural liberal, liberalism, an alliance between economic elites and green elites. They exploit the policy, policy agenda of the higher educated, the winners of globalization. Look at the great leap forward in the EU, look at radical climate politics, Green Deal, soft on migration, digitalization, and a radical change again agenda. And this agenda for higher educated only is undermining the contract between lower middle class and higher middle class in our societies, which is causing the crisis of social democracy, and maybe even the post Merkel Christian democracy, when the CDU will get too easily into a coalition with the Greens. Yeah. This, this can change the configuration in Germany that the lower middle classes in Germany will not be feel represented by this green black coalition. This is a real danger. My fifth and final observation is about how we should respond. We have to fight populism by beating the deep rooted causes of populism. We need to restore the social contracts of society also for non-academic professionals and also for not for neglected regions. We have to restore the social contract of the welfare state or the social state. This means delivering economic security, social security and cultural continuity. I'm always impressed by this existential expression of Chancellor Merkel, Deutschland muss Deutschland bleiben. That's a very existential expression. And Deutschland muss Deutschland bleiben this means be careful with European integration. Don't go into a discourse of the end of the nation state. Be careful with migration and integration. We need a kind of Western light culture and be careful with rapid change against traditions and have respect for non-academic labor. These, these are important elements in how to respond to populism. To conclude, what is at stake? If CDU fails in Germany and VVD fails in the Netherlands in reconciling the establishment and the non-establishment, the lower middle class and the higher middle class, then we could end up post Merkel and post Rutte in a depolarization US style in Europe, which means the end of the magic of Western European middle class societies. And this I think we must avoid at all costs from happening. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. And uh, as you could just see, uh, I was changing uh, the, the little machine <laughs> with René Couperos because we sit together here and, and share one thing so that there is no overlap of the sounds. Uh, with this, uh, let me now turn to uh, Mrs. Fischlag from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. She is working on those issues in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. She is with us from uh, Germany, from Berlin. And uh, if I could add one point uh, for you, Frau Fischlager, you just heard René Coperos talk about the Dutch situation where we have two populist parties, the PVV, and he described a little bit the, uh, uh, the support groups, so to say, of the PVV. But we also have the Forum for Democratie uh, from um, uh, Thierry Baudet, which is catering to a somewhat different audience. So when you discuss the scene in Germany or the scene from a German perspective, could you perhaps also look into that? Uh, is this a risk also in Germany or is uh, the situation in Germany so different 
that there is not enough space, so to say, for two populist parties. And with this uh, extra addition, so to say, of a question over to Frau Fischlage, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Over to you. Thank you very much, dear Ambassador, and good morning, everyone from Berlin. Greetings from Berlin. And yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to give some insight into the German from German perspectives and German current development. And of course, I'm happy to answer your questions. I would do this in the end because I think then I can directly link it to my um, input or uh, impulse vortrag, as you said. Um, so for a long time um, in Germany, we did not have this real problem of um, populism, maybe due to history, but also due to the fact that the media played a, plays a crucial role also as a bulwark against populism. So. Uh, in Germany, this topic did not play a major role uh, for, for a lot of long time. And I want to different, the, the differ, differentiate between left and right populism in this, uh, in this input, because I will focus more on the right wing populism because it's excluding uh, people of different backgrounds, so religion, sexuality, culture. And I think this is also one topic that plays a major role in Germany right now, the right wing populism. And um, so I will mainly uh, talk about this. Um, so when talking about populism in Germany, we see that this is more also like has a cultural national question, a conflict that makes it also easier for populists. We see this migration topic, for example, that was really also on national, national cultural issues. And so um, when talking about Germany, it was only a matter of time, actually, until this populist, populism or topic of populism also entered the German stage. So we were always uh, looking to our neighboring countries where we saw developments quite earlier. But uh, for a long time now, we are also dealing with this topic in Germany. So in 2013, for example, the uh, AFD didn't make it into the Bundestag. They, we have a threshold of 5%. So they were not successful, even though um, their result was about 4.7%. So they nearly made it. But in 2017, they entered the Bundestag and they are, yeah, were quite successful, not only on the national level, but also on the regional levels as well. So right now they are in every regional parliament and they are also the biggest opposition party in the Bundestag. Um, so until now there is no uh, coalition with AFD, either on the regional level nor on the national level. And um, it also became more difficult for AFD due to further developments within the party. I will come to this later. Um, yeah, to keep up the image of a center-right party as an alternative for, for CDU voters, for example, or liberal voters. So what are the current developments? Um, there is a populism barometer of Bertelsmann Stiftung or colleagues from Bertelsmann um, Stiftung. Um, there is a survey about populism in Germany. And what I think is quite interesting here is that the result is that 20.9%, so two out of 10, uh, of the electorate have a populistic view. And this is a decrease by 11.8 points in comparison to the survey in 2018. And I was wondering what happened during this time. Why is there some, maybe some kind of decrease in uh, populistic um, yeah, um, uh, opinion among the electorate? So I think one point is the increasing satisfaction with policymaking and the government. Um, this is, um, I think, one of the advantages having really a clear stance and a clear position on certain issues. And I think this was really that, that developed within the last years. Um, we also see this in times of Corona, um, that there was really the focus more on the government instead of the, um, the, the populistic parties. And he also mentioned that as well. And especially the political center um, became more active and resistant against populism. That is what we see in Germany now, especially in regard of this survey. So the political uh, act center plays some kind of anchor or stability factor within this yeah, political, political and party system. But apart from this, so saying the government, um, there was a higher satisfaction with the government and also with their position and stance on certain issues. I think a, a second important development is the developments within the AFD himself. So um, what we, what René already said that they were, they were always in 2013 when the AFD was founded by Bernd Lucke, within the AFD we always had developments becoming more and more radical. So this is a development that's still continuing. 
So I don't know if you heard about the dissolution of the Flügel, this uh, yeah, one organization within the AFD. Um, there was a dissolution of it. This is a right extremist, right nationalist organization within the AFD. And um, nevertheless, even though there's a dissolution of this Flügel, we cannot see that uh, this stopped. So with the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution um, is still saying there are certain people within this Flügel, even though it's not official anymore, that are still active. There are still connections, there's still a network of it. So um, the radicals within the AFD are slowly taking over the position, not only on the board, but also in different fractions. For example, we see the dissolution of a faction in Niedersachsen, uh, Lower Saxony, mm -hmm. um, a dissolution of uh, AFD fraction in, in uh, Schleswig-Holstein. And this also has some kind of financial impact, of course, on AFD. Uh, furthermore, we see some kind of generational generation change within AFD. So um, yeah, the radical parts of AFD are still there and they are still having more and more impact on it. What does it mean? So a lot of voters do not want to support this party and this party anymore, maybe because it's too radical. So this radicalization within the AFD makes it easier for other parties to have a clear stance. For example, when talking about how did the German established parties dealt with populism in Germany, we see that in the beginning they were, they were quite insecure how to deal with them. Should we ignore them? Should we yeah, just hope that they will go away. And so this further development and radicalization makes it also easier for the established party to have a clear stance and think that a coalition with AFD is not, not acceptable or doable. So as I said, the federal office for the protection of constitution already observed the Flügel, this organization within, but also the AFD tries to protect themselves from uh, getting under observation. This becomes quite difficult as we see that some major actors within the AFD belong to this uh, right extremist uh, part of the party. So um, yeah, we see that uh, there were certain developments within the AFD, but also in times of Corona, AFD and other populists could not really use this kind of crisis. They were more reacting instead of proactive, giving some kind of, um, yeah, clear stance on their position in kind of Corona. So for example, when talking about the um, appearance of Beatrix von Storch without wearing a mask in the Bundestag, this was more like a reaction to all this protest maybe on the street, instead of proactively having their position on the Corona measurements. So what does it mean for the future in Germany? And I also want to include your question, Mr. Ambassador, into this um, yeah, final remarks, it's called like that. Um, I think established parties in Germany found a more, yeah, found a way how to deal with populism in Germany, having more clear stance on their position. Um, also knowing that ignoring or hoping is not the best way, also not. We see also for example in Austria that including them into coalition didn't even uh, make them less strong. So I think this is one issue that we learned in Germany also from our uh, friends abroad how to deal with populism. And I think this is really something that is the established parties uh, became much better in. Um, so doing good politics, really solving the problems of the population. I think this is really what happened, especially due to the first uh, part of the Corona pandemic, um, place more attention to the government instead of the populism. So this means that of course we have to deal with populism, but I think we should not give them more attention as is necessary. And so nevertheless, I would say, of course, we see some kind of decreasing support maybe right now. Of course, it does not mean that we should not focus on populism anymore. I think it's just some kind of, um, some kind of hope, but it's not saying, okay, we have, don't have to deal with populism anymore. Um, so currently the AFD is about 10 to 12%. Uh, we have elections next year. And so uh, I think there is nothing like saying, okay, uh, due to this uh, barometer or screw in surveys, they will not have a chance. So I think this will be quite important. And coming back to your question, will there be two populist parties? I think um, it really depends on the development of AFD right now. If there is a stronger development into radical right, radical extremist party, um, maybe becoming NPD 2.0, as it said sometimes, 
um, I think there would be some kind of yeah possibility for a new uh, political uh, right populist party. Right now, I don't see this, but uh, yeah, the AFD is still developing. As I said, there are really radical uh, actors within this party right now. So yeah, right now I don't see it, but could be of course a chance in the uh, coming fu uh, future, and especially in regard of how the development within the AFD will continue. So thank you so much so far. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Fislager. And uh, we have invited uh, those who are observing our webinar to ask questions, uh, in, in particular through the chat function in the YouTube uh, channel. Let me check with uh, our colleague. Is there, there are no questions yet? No questions yet. So I would call on those who have been listening to uh, the webinar to, uh, once uh, they have uh, listened to these two impulse vorträge to, uh, to have their questions put through the uh, chat function. We'll see whether they are coming in. Uh, we can also react to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, see yes. Uh, yeah. No, no, no reaction yet. No okay, so we'll do a little change. Uh, we'll have, uh, because uh, we're now observing the chat function uh, for questions to come in, but uh, I think at that moment, maybe it's a good occasion uh, for René to react uh, a little bit on what uh, we have just heard uh, from Frau Fislager. So let me... And the other way around. And the other way around, naturally. Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So first, uh, René, uh, back to Ms. Fislager, and then we'll see whether we have been garnering some, some questions on the chat function. René Couperos. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much for your clear presentation from Berlin. I just had, had one remark. What, what, what puzzled me, what's, what's interesting about AFD is this radicalization of AFD. Yeah, and, and in a way, that's exactly what you see in the Netherlands. You see that the Wilders party is much more radical than its electorate. And also Baudet is more radical than his voters. Yeah, he's also playing around with Corona de crisis deniers and these kind of issues, which are completely disliked by the Dutch electorate. And also Wilders being anti-Europe is a much too radical position for the general public in the Netherlands. And that's the same applies to the AFD. It seems that populist parties are not interested in voter maximization, which is all the political scientists say parties are there for voter maximization and political power. But it seems that populist parties are, are always looking for radicalization, which is making them less popular for the broader electorate. Why is that? Is, is there a discussion within AFD about becoming more popular for the electoral vote, or is it just internal fights which, which cause this radicalization? This is rather puzzling to me. Why are populist parties so counterproductive in gaining political power? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, uh, let, me, let me add, uh, we got a question here through touch channel, so to say. Uh, which is, uh, you, Mrs. Fislag said the uh, CDU has established quite an uh, intelligent system of dealing with populism. Uh, so one of the questions we were getting here from Dutch uh, is uh, how firm uh, is this? Is there, now nah, I, I wouldn't want to overdo it, but is this uh, guaranteed, so to say? And I can tell you the background to that question actually was what some people here found difficult to, to, uh, to, to appreciate what it really meant were events in Thüringen. You, you remember the election there in the, in the Landtag. Mm -hmm. And um, another question I was getting has to do also with uh, the CDU, which is that um, some would, critic, uh, would be critical that the CDU has been going to the middle and perhaps left some open space on its right. The usual thing which we then hear is the Strauss mantra. Many people here know that. Mm -hmm. And they would be making observations like if, uh, if there is not a, a, a tension within the CDU, CSU, 
uh, well, and, and some of them may have heard, you know, what is called in Germany, die Werte Union. Um, and I perhaps uh, it's a more detail, but perhaps would be good also to say a word or two on, uh, on how strong that, uh, that part of the party, it's not really a part of the party, how strong they are of tendencies like this. Uh, with this to Frau Fisslager. Hey, thank you very much. There are a lot of questions and comments. First, I would like to uh, get one question back to René because he was saying something like lender, lender stalls. And I would like to get some more deeper in, uh, yeah, exper uh, experience and uh, input from him. What does he really mean with lender stalls? Because we see this in Barbara, yes, but I don't see this in, in other regions. So I would be more interested in that. Um, Not our failure, yes. yes, and um, maybe talking about this uh, strategy about the CDU, how firm it is. I think especially due to the development of AFD, this is quite firm right now. So um, I think we really see not only among CDU, but also along, among the other political parties that there was a real change of how to yeah, have some kind of strategy, really from hoping, sometimes also ignoring. I think CDU was in the beginning also ignoring and really hoping that the um, AFD might vanish and didn't really um, um, have a clear stand on the AFD as well. So I think the strategy right now is quite firm, saying that the developments right now in AFD, they are anti-democratic, anti-pluralistic. So uh, for a, a CDU, I would say they are quite firm. The case we saw in Turingia is quite interesting because I think it became really obvious in this situation how the AFD is undermining the, our political democratic procedures, some kind of. Um, so playing some kind of tricks, how to yeah, um, blame the political system, the democ democratic procedure in Turing. Yeah? So I think it was quite, quite good actually that there was a new, um, that there was a new election afterwards. Um, but I think we have to be more aware of how populist parties, how they are making, how they are trying to uh, make the political system and political procedures ridiculous. And so um, I think it's really important to get a better understanding how, what kind might be certain strategies of AFD also um, in order to prevent this kind of things happening. Um, I think this question um, we have for several years now, I think it has already started in 2013, uh, so is it maybe due to the CDU, they became more moved to the center, so there was an open space on the right. I think if we really um, deal with this question, and I think most of the uh, people within CDU, um, the members, but also the voters are saying, if there were, will be a shift to the right, this will not be supported, not even by the, not by the voters, but also, but not only, uh, also by the most of the members of the party. So I think um, the world had changed. So um, I think it will not be successful for CDU to making a shift to the right again, because they will then lose voters on the left. So um, I think this is quite for sure now. I think we don't have this discussion anymore. It's at least not so much uh, the focus on this uh, question anymore. And I think this Werte Union you were asking, I think they are not an official group within CDU. I think they are, get more attention than they should because there is not official organization. There are some people within the Red Union who are saying, yes, there should be a shift to the right, but there's, this is still a minority. minority. So I think um, as this is not an, any official organization within CDU, but more like um, several individuals coming together, I think it's not yeah, necessary to focus on this group um, specifically. Um, and to this question of Rene with these internal fights. Mm, yeah, I think in the beginning it was really, um, Frauke Petri, Petri once stated, it's, we are lucky that we have the migration crisis. And why is that? Because they were saying, we need this problem, problem um, to win voters, right? And we really now see that there is some kind of development. They are really people, they're not, and their main idea is not to win the voters. Their main idea is to establish um, a party that is, has white extremists and white nationalists uh, tendencies. So, um, yeah, I think the main aim of some of the people within AFD is not winning a voters because they might see that this is not, um, they might not be successful. We see this in Netherlands, as you said. 
So uh, I think some people are really more focusing on how to build a right extremist, right nationalist party. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, before I give the floor back to René, uh, also with respect to Länderstolz, I can add to you said that is probably in Bavaria. Not so sure about that, uh, but I would add that uh, Länderstolz uh, sometimes is more a regional identity. Mm -hmm. For example, as we all know, Nordrhein-Westfalen is what we call a Bindestrichstaat, but there are strong regional identities in terms of uh, Rhineländer or Westfalen or Münsterländer. But uh, mm -hmm. before I give uh, the floor back to René and then after again to you, Ms. Feslage, we have gotten some questions here and I will read them slowly so you can take uh, some notes on what we have been asked here. So I have uh, one question from Hamid. Uh, uh, do you think that the Brexit will boost populism in Europe uh, once it happened? Uh, I have gotten another question by Julian uh, Camilo Silva, something we are experiencing right now in other parts of the world is that populism replaces traditional political parties, either because it replaces them or because it metastasis within them so that they get uh, split in uh, uh, different directions. So that uh, I think you, you went into that a little bit already, but maybe we can have more. Uh, the same uh, colleague you have spoken about outside populism, populist political parties, but how is populism inside most traditional political parties in the Netherlands and in Germany? So within the political parties, but I think he also means by that how strongly influence uh, populist parties, the mainstream parties in their decision making. Are they running behind populist parties, so to say? Um, again, Hamid, uh, he came back. Uh, Muslims and black people are part of of marginalized societies in Europe, but do they not have a voice in many European countries, even among populist parties? That's an interesting question. Uh, then uh, the, Tobias Noch, I think there are two points one should put into the discussion. A, humans have a psychological tendency to populism. That's an interesting thesis. Uh, it is a human condition which has and it always will be there. So this is a more fundamental question, how much populism streak is part of our psychology. The same person there and going on with society, there in every society can be exploited at all times with or without social problems. So you can always use this uh, and he's referring to Hannah Arendt in this uh, uh, comment. Um, so he's also looking at the troll fabrications in Russia and the Cambridge Analytica. So that, that he's referring to people using it for their own means and ends. Um, and he would like to know what do you think about this and what would you say is the motivation in the background to create an increased populism, i.e. who will benefit from it. And when he referred to trolls, we have seen uh, some, some media reports that some countries, <laughs> I think you will all know what I'm referring to, that some countries may be using trolls more than others uh, to be able to influence the electoral uh, process in countries or the democratic decision process. I think at this point, I will go back to uh, René, and uh, I think that is a lot of questions, and let's see how far we, we get uh, in answering them. So for this, uh, René Couperos again, and we change. Yes, here we are. A list of interesting questions. I cannot answer them at all, all at once, I think. Uh, first of all, I want to say that Germany is a bit lucky with its populism because the populist parties you have, the Linke and AfD, are both tainted, poisoned parties. The Linke is tainted by the SED history, past, which makes them less, less credible than, than a regular party. And the AfD is tainted or poisoned by their Flügel and by neo-Nazi links. 
Yeah, so you are in a bit a bit lucky with your uh, supply of populist parties to say. Yeah? I always say to Germans, what will happen if there is a Bildzeitung populist party in Germany mm -hmm. without any links to the neo-Nazi past, whatever. Bildzeitung populism, when hey, there's a leader completely free of neo-Nazi connections or whatsoever, no connections to Eastern Germany, what will be then the test for the traditional parties in Germany? That's the real issue. What will happen if you have a Bildzeitung populism? Because I'm always, you have to distinguish between re reacting to populist parties and populist politicians and the populist problems which are in our societies, which are, have to do with the cleavage in our society between higher educated and lower educated, which is also very strong in Germany. Yeah, I saw recent figures about social mobility in Germany, which is very, very low. It's comparable to the US. It's completely not Scandinavian. The cleavage between gymnasium and Hauptschule is massive in Germany. You never become higher educated when you started with a Hauptschule. That's in Germany, very strong cleavage in society and populism is dealing with these kind of tensions. And of course, what we experience in both in the Netherlands and in Germany that the, over this very heated debate about populism is the shadow of the Second World War. It's the shadow of the, 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 the scars of the 20th century. Populism is a way of, is a return of bad temper from the 20th century, which makes this debate very problematic and complicated, but we have to deal, I think, with the populist tensions in our society much more than with the populist parties. Because in Holland, this is a really a splitting issue. Eh? I'm, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the problems of the CDA. Eh? They are completely split about should we work together with the Forum for Democracy or not. Eh? It's about 50-50% within the CDA that they differ about cooperation with the Thierry Baudet party although they have a cordon sanitaire around the Wilders party. But you see that the center parties in our society are completely torn apart by these populist tensions in our society. This does not account for the Greens. It does not account for the populists. It's a center parties where they have to deal with these tensions in our society. That, that's my first remark. My second remark is about Brexit. One of the questions I think of Hamid or another questionnaire. I think that Brexit will not lead to a boost of populism. It will, I think it will be the other way around. Everyone, Brexit might lead to a chaos in the UK, may, may lead to an economic crisis, may lead to a political crisis in the UK. So I think that, that we, you, we already saw a backlash in Europe about the referenda instruments. Nobody likes referenda anymore after the Brexit referendum. Which, which did so much harm to the UK. So I think that we see a counterproductive effect that populism will, less, will be less popular because of Brexit, because of the results and the causes of Brexit. That would be my first answer to one of the questions. And I leave it here and then I go, then we can go back to Berlin. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ms. Fislag, uh, would you uh, care to, to go through some of those questions I've just put forward to you yeah. from our audience? Yes, sure. So I uh, agree with uh, René about the Brexit. I think it's also important right now how to deal with the Brexit, saying mm -hmm. that uh, a Brexit is not a good chance for, for other states. So being quite also quite strict on you cannot have everything from the table. So I think this Brexit will not be a boost for populism in, in Europe. There was the question, I think, of if populism replaces traditional parties. I think what we, when I got the question right, right? Uh, I think one um, development that the, we see right now is there is increase coming up of new political parties new political movements. We see a higher, increasing voter, uh, voter volatility. Uh, we see an increasing um, number of, of new parties who have a quite huge impact. I mean, just keep in mind La République en Marche, for example, uh, first election and uh, directly successful with thesis and other countries as well. We see the Five Star Movement, etc. So in general, we see that there are a lot of new parties coming. Of course, they are not all populist. 
Um, but of, I think they are really a challenge for the traditional parties. So I think the traditional parties do not only have to deal with populism, but also with new political parties that play a, uh, can may, uh, play a major role within the political party system, naming um, becoming directly uh, the head of the state or becoming a part of the uh, government. So I think uh, populism does not replace traditional parties. But I think traditional parties, uh, populism might be a big challenge for traditional parties. Also, how to um, foster uh, their clear position on certain issues. Um, I think there was also the question about the 12, 12 function uh, of among populism. Um, quite interesting that we also see this um, directly uh, before ele elections. And I think it's quite interesting how generally we see how this uh, might have an impact on social media in general. I mean, also talking about social bots, et cetera. And it's quite interesting that uh, at least for the election 2017, there was a clear position on all the uh, established parties that it's not, uh, that they are not supporting any social bots, et cetera, uh, social media. This for the populist party, this was not so sure. So they're saying, okay, is there a social bots, et cetera, that's totally fine. So I think we have a quite, yeah, different um, position against trolls and social bots, et cetera, within the populist party and among the established parties. Um, yeah, so I will leave it to this for, for a while. Um, yeah. I'm, can I add one more question for both of you, but I start with you, Mrs. Fislager. And that is a question which uh, is in the air these days, and uh, it's about the situation in the United States. And the question is, do you think that a possible Trump win might further boost European populist parties and also lead to further communication connection between what we call in the US the alt-right and the European far-right uh, populist parties? So this is about a, uh, the impact of a possible win of uh, President Trump and the connection between all right, and our populist parties. Uh, back to you, Mrs. Fislager. I think we already see some kind of impact right now, um, not only on the political culture. I think when talking about political culture in Germany right now, the, tough, uh, the tone got quite rough. Um, I think uh, Trump is not the best example, um, is the best example actually to, to show how the, how the culture changed actually, not only in the US, but also um, I think in every political uh, culture. So um, will there be a further boost actually? I think it will not make it easier actually because we know how Trump is communicating, um, how he is um, faming um, minorities, et cetera. And I think this will give some kind of, um, yeah, giving some kind of example for other uh, populist parties as well. Um, talking about this, or, um, this right movements, I think we already see that also within Germany, the popular right wing populist party, and um, that we already see some kind of connection with uh, the Identitäre Bewegung, um, right, the new right movement in Germany as well. So there are already linkages. And I think uh, if Trump will win the election, I don't see any chance that this will, uh, this will decrease, actually. Yeah, and um, that's uh, fair to say. And uh, there's also lately this QNAN. Uh, uh, also for, for René, uh, mm -hmm. two further questions which reached us uh, via mail uh, and perhaps uh, later then uh, also for Ms. Fislager. What is the impact of migration of populism? And uh, is Corona, and this is very topical right now, but is it in the long run an important topic like the refugee crisis and can it have an impact on what we are discussing now? I think yesterday in Germany, we have what we call the Integrationsgipfel and our chancellor clearly said that uh, the migrants are much impacted by the uh, Corona crisis. Mm -hmm. But the question here would rather be whether that then again would uh, make a populist party stronger. I think you went into that issue already before. So let me go back to René Coupel. Thank you, Frau Fisslage, for this contribution. Back to René. Here we are. These are very big, interesting questions, especially the Trump win. What will be the effect on populism in Europe? 
I'm, I'm not sure that Trump is really a role model for a populist parties in, in the Netherlands. I never hear Geert Wilders or Thierry Baudet say, I love Trump so much. I think his, his, his way of performing is so troublesome that nobody dares to see him as a role model. But I, I think that there might be an indirect effect because what, what, I, fe what I fear is uh, this, this drifting apart of Europe and America. Yeah, I, the, 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 the crisis of the transatlantic relations. I th I'm, I'm not. I'm very much worried about that yeah? because I also see people in Europe using Trump as a as as a way to express their anti-Americanism. Yeah? They don't like America whatsoever, so they use Trump as the bad American. And if if Trump wins again, I think this drifting apart of Europe and and and, and America will be much more problematic, and it even applies to the Westbindung of Germany. Eh? Will the Westbindung of Germany, of Adenauer, be only the, the Bindung with France, or will there still be an Atlantic Bindung? Yeah, yes or no? That's, but there's a very fundamental issue here uh, that, 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 that worries me. Um, talk, eh, yeah, populism is, is very complex. Eh? We did not go into definitions or hey, you, it's, it's from also the, the conspiracy lunatics eh, with this QAnon people who are even here in The Hague yeah, protesting at the Parliament Square uh, every day, I think, that is anti-corona conspiracy uh, lunatics. They are, they are quite influential even in the Netherlands yeah, at the moment. They are not big numbers, but they, through social media, which is one of the populist channels, they have their influence. And I, that, that, that worries me also for the, for, the, for the corona crisis. How long will the corona crisis be under us? and how much division, how much conflict potential will be a consequence of the corona crisis. That's also a big question, I think, both in Germany and the Netherlands. Mm. Uh, migration, I think that migration is the trigger for populism, especially in Germany. You, 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 in, in Germany, you saw that the IFD, after their anti-Euro campaign, was nearly dead. And then this refugee crisis came and the IFD uh, became bigger, bigger with all the amounts of, of refugees arriving in Germany. Uh, Lender election after Lender election, you saw the IFD increasing because of the refugee amounts of, of, of people. So there's a very strong correlation between the rise of AFD and the refugee crisis. Um, that, that's true. But I, as I try to express in my presentation, there are under needs, there are very yeah, we are we are dealing with a completely different society at the moment, as and we are dealing with the fragmentation of the people's parties, especially the social democratic parties. Look at the SPD in Germany. Look at the CDU potentially. Can they still be thirty percent plus parties, which is the definition of a people's party? Thirty percent. Yeah, if you look to, and this is the big issue: can they reconcile the different? Uh, groups in our society still, which is one of the most important functions of people's parties. How, how can they bring together people within the welfare state and li within liberal democracy? And if you fail that task, hey, we, we might end up in a polarized situation like the USA. That, that's my warning today. And that, that's, I think, a very important question for the coming uh, years, especially when the corona crisis is not leading, leave, leading to reconciliation, but to more division in our society. That's the big question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I get the machine back to mm -hmm. me. Thank you. And go uh, back uh, in a moment to Frau Fisslage, but add one more question, which we got uh, from uh, Frank Alcera. Facebook has stricter rules now about using political ads in the US campaign. Do you think this will help against populism? And do we need more rules for the big tech in EU elections? Um, yeah, I think that's a fair question. And it somewhat uh, uh, helps to have this question as an add-on to the question which we have had before on the US side, on uh, Trump uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, alt-right. And let me add one further question, perhaps for my colleagues at the Konrad Adenauer in Brussels. Uh, maybe they would like to reflect on that and, and give us a, a little insight on how much of a coordination is there in Europe, in Brussels, between the populist parties. They have 
if I'm not mistaken, two political families in the European Parliament, uh, but there's more than just the European Parliament, uh, which for some of them is not really their home base. Uh, so I would be interested in what uh, mm -hmm. also you, Fislar, can say on, uh, to us on European coordination between the political and the populist parties. So uh, over to you again, Frau Fislager. Yes, something, uh, two points actually. I would totally agree with René that um, Donald Trump as, a, as USA, representing USA is not of course not a role model, but his way of communication, you know, always crossing a red line. I think this is quite something that is uh, his performance actually just um, is something that might um, have an impact on populism in Europe as well. Um, the impact of the migration crisis and the uh, refugee, refugee crisis or refugee movements, um, I think we will also have to really see how the coronavirus will, uh, the pandemic will develop. I think as Rini said, the um, migration is a big trigger in Germany for AFD and they are really clearly stating that. Uh, I don't know if you saw there was a big documentation um, a few weeks ago uh, where there was the, the speaker of the AFD fraction um, was really saying that, yeah, please first they should enter. So really make, um, using this as a trigger for, for, for voters especially. Um, so I think one of the questions that might uh, play a role, but as Rene said, the AFD was not so successful after the um, uh, EU crisis. So, but there could be, of course, um, due to having common depth and saying, okay, we have to act as a, a Europe, uh, as Europe together, this might also play a role, but I think the major role will still be um, the migration issue. And I think this will come back due to the globalization. I think there will always be migration and think this will be a big topic as, uh, still also in the future. Um, the question about Facebook and stricter rules, I'm not an expert on, on, on the social media issues, but I think a lot of people are getting most of the information from social media today. And so I think it's also important to have some kind of uh, moderating system saying what are um, what are the intentions of ads, for example, um, what is uh, if there are statements that are not uh, in accordance with the constitution, for example, to um, uh, vanish them. So I think there is some kind of stricter rules needed because a lot of people are mainly getting the information from social media. And I'm not only talking about their, their bubble, uh, but also in general, um, how the social media, not only Facebook, there are other platforms as well, Twitter, et cetera, uh, playing a crucial role in, in, uh, in these days for getting information for, for people. So I think always having some kind of, um, yeah, moderation, some kind of, um, yeah, might be necessary in the future, even though it's, of course, for Facebook quite difficult to do. Yeah, I will give the question for the Europe, uh, European level to my colleagues in Brussels, of course. Yeah, let me see uh, Hadi Ostri oh. and uh, his colleague. Uh, I. You heard uh, this question? Yes, we heard it there. Thank you very much. It's a quite interesting question, um, which brings us back to the European elections 2019 and the campaign. Because, uh, for example, we all know that Steve Bannon, he tried to organize, let's say, uh, from Brussels, uh, a very interesting campaign mobilizing for populist parties, but he totally failed. So there was no success. And even after the elections, uh, first of all, the, the, the let's say, populist movements of the right tried to, uh, let's say, create one parliamentary group. But once again, they failed. So that shows us that ideological coherence with regard to some of their interests uh, will not automatically mean that they are able to create uh, one stand when it comes to a parliamentary group or interest group. So uh, they are very much fighting against each other. Uh, and this is the reason why there are two, let's say, uh, parliamentary groups in the European Parliament with regard to these more right-wing populist uh, 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 movements. Oh. Uh, and and as, at least as far as we know and, and observe it, probably there are some other groups or parties trying to, to organize more coherent approaches, but uh, not on the level of the European Parliament. Okay, thank you. If you would like to add something? Yeah, uh, Herr Gläser. 
Yeah, I think um, what we also should keep in mind, I mean, Brussels is all about um, certain bubbles. I mean, there's the EU bubble, the German bubble. Of course, every political party family has its own bubble. And I think it is also interesting to mention that outside of the European Parliament and maybe also a bit outside of the party political context, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of pre um, a lot of uh, groups or other uh, institutions that have a representation in Brussels who try to push um, for a more conservative agenda, for a more populist agenda. And they are actively approaching those um, parties that we would consider as populists, um, regardless of their party um, family affiliation in the European Parliament. And I think um, this is also an, an, like, yeah, an interesting aspect that should be taken into account that it's not only in the European Parliament, but also in the city and also um, in different settings that there is actors who actively try to push the European agenda more towards um, the goals of these parties. And um, this is something that can be observed. It doesn't always um, take place um, in the most um, privileged settings, but um, it is definitely something that uh, should be taken into account when it comes to the ID party group or the ECR or like the non-aligned uh, member parties who we would consider um, as a right-wing populists. Thank you. Thank you to our Brussels colleagues for that. But Ambassador, um, just, just uh, if yeah. you don't mind, I just would like to, to let's say, to have a look on this whole discussion from another angle, if you don't mind. I know that we are talking foremost about Germany and the Netherlands, but as I know the discussions in our party and also in the CDA a little bit, uh, I just would like to, 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 to hint a look to, to Austria. Populism is always regarded as negative. Uh, but nevertheless, there are also some, let's say, uh, developments which showed us, let's say, by ideologically borrowing some populist ideas, uh, make even some new developments possible. So uh, if we look, for example, on uh, the traditional ÖVP party in Austria and the new movement created by Sebastian Kurz and the success his movement had in the uh, last elections, two elections, in fact. So uh, what should we, how should we classify these developments from, from our, uh, uh, let's say, point of view? This would be interesting to me to, to, uh, to hear it from René and also from Assis Lager. As I indicated, we also have had that debate in Germany a lot. Uh, I remember the elections in Bavaria where Söder was taking a different swing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, becoming more opposed, so to say, in the end to the AfD. So everybody is uh, taking his own cue there. Before I give the floor back to René Couperus and uh, Frau Fislage, uh, adding to what you have just heard, I have a further question here, which is far right parties will accelerate the marginalization of Muslims and black uh, people, for example, in Europe. Is there a way for stopping this? So it's about marginalization of, uh, of minorities, of people who are in a difficult spot. Um, thank you. And uh, back mm. to René Couperos. Yeah. So. Thank you. I will start to answer the questions from the Konrad Adenauer system in Brussels, because I think that it's important. It's interesting to, men, to, to, to watch the international of nationalists. Yeah, I think it's very, very curious that the nationalists have international cooperation, that intensive that they have. Yeah, uh, and I think that it doesn't take place all in the European Parliament. I think they have very strong links between the right-wing populists internationally, even more than some social democrats and Christian democrats. Eh? Don't, don't be, don't, eh? don't, don't underestimate, I think, the international context of Wilders and Baudet. And I'm not in politics anymore, but I, I cannot, uh, I have to ask the question to Brussels because the role model of the right-wing populists are not, is not Donald Trump, but it's Victor Orban. And, he is the role model of, of many right-wing populists yeah, everywhere, of Charlie Baudet, of Wilders, they visit him, him, and he is part of the Christian Democratic family, as we all know. That, that, is a, that is a problem, I think, for CDU and for the Christian democracy in general, how to deal with the role model of right-wing populism within your own ranks. Yeah, that's, that's still an open question, but that's, that's very curious to, 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 to observe. 
Um, the second, the, the question about what, what do we all have? Uh, no, Orban was the most important. I'm not so sure, but no, that, that was my, I, I, I have no questions anymore on my list. Okay, yeah. then. Uh, but there was a question to Brussels. How do, you do, yeah. with, how do we deal with the Orban? Okay, problem? then uh, that, that, uh, will, uh, that is a nice one for Brussels, but we take that as sweetener for the debate. <laughs> towards the end. Frau Fischlager, is there something you would like to add from your side? Yeah, maybe about this question, um, populism accelerate the marginalization. I yes, think this is one, one, of course, of the main topics of populism um, to, to um, mobilize against migration about different background, about different uh, sexuality, etc., different religion. And so how to stop it? I think we have to stop the, the populism. And I think this is of course more easy to say than it's done, of course. Uh, I'm, we are, every one of us is sure about that. Um, but I think uh, Willie just saying, of course, everyone coming to Germany belongs to our society, should be integrated. Um, all of them, of course, um, are some kind of part of, um, the Germ of Germany, of course. So I think we really have to yeah, have a clear stance and clear position on this. And this is also especially for the established parties so that we do not allow the populace to, yeah, to accelerate this marginalization. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, Herr Ostri, there was this uh, question from René Couperos <laughs> on, on your political family. Yeah, okay, first of all, I totally regret if uh, uh, Viktor Orban serves as a role model for those movements. Yeah? Uh, this is uh, totally uh, not acceptable. But on the other hand, yes, it's true that we still have there an open question, which has to be solved on the level of the uh, uh, EPP of the European People's Party. Mm -hmm. That's all what we can say for the time being. You know that inside the party, we have a lot of discussions, uh, especially when it comes to our values, rule of law, and so on. Um, but, and this is not to, let's say, shift the problem to our other uh, next friends, but this is a problem all the political families on the European level have. Mm. If you still think about Romania and SND, they solved it for the time being, but this is a problem. Mm. And I so think this is... This is a question when it comes to the functionality of European party movements. Because uh, the higher the level, uh, uh, or more abstract the level of party integration, you always will have these problems. And the European People's Party is a party of so different member parties, as well as the other SND, ALDE, and so on, and, and uh, Renew now from Macron. So, I don't see how it will, we will figure this problem out, but I think until end of the year, probably beginning next year, there will be a solution. Thank you. And uh, may, maybe just a moment to highlight uh, your political family is the EPP, the CDU, the CDU and CDA. And uh, I think it's no secret that there is a very good uh, collaboration or cooperation and understanding between the CDU and the CDA, and, and uh, that, that is good to know and good to have. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are now coming more to the end of our event, of our webinar. Uh, and uh, uh, let me give the floor back for a little moment again to René and then uh, to Berlin. And I'll be doing some closing comments after that. So mm -hmm. back again to René, and that's the last time we now change the machine. It always mm -hmm. looks awkward, I know. There's some techni technical, pro technical problems here. Thank you. Now, I forgot to answer the question of the Conrad Adenauer Steve Toon about copying elements or program ideas from populism, yeah, the, the Kurz model in Austria, which I think is very interesting and important. And we should not, I, I'm in favor of that, to be honest. Uh, but it cannot be done in many parties. Eh? We have, in a, I'm, I'm a social democrat originally, and we have a role model for that in Denmark. And there's a Danish social democratic party, which has a very strong position on migration and integration uh, as, a, as a kind of defense of the welfare state of Denmark. And I'm in favor of that kind of program. But we tried to do that in the Netherlands, but it's completely, it's, it's split up our party. 
because many social democrats in the Netherlands are in fact greens and not social democrats. And they don't like any change in immigration and integration policies. And I think also SPD in Germany is for 80% green and not social democrat in, in terms of this position on migration, integration and, and, and these kind of issues. And so it can be done in Austria, it can be done in Denmark, but it, it, it will not work in, in Germany because of all the tensions within your country. Söder tried to do that. Uh, he tried to do the Kurz uh, model, but I think there are tensions within CDU and that's also within SPD to change, to make a, accommodation in this direction to the populists problem. And I think that's, that's, that might, may be very problematic in the long run, because we, we, we should not underestimate how different parties like CDU and SPD are now from the past. In the past, we were, we were much more populist. We are now, we have become bureaucratic party machines. We are, have very low, we are not rooted in society anymore as we were in the 50s or the 70s or the 80s. So we, we, should, we should acknowledge the enormous change of, of people's parties over the, over the decade. And we have to correct that direction, I think, to be able to, to be a bridge in society again. So thanks for that uh, interesting question from Brussels. Here you go again. So, and uh, as I said, uh, that is the last uh, change of the machine now. And uh, let me again look to Frau Fislage. Frau Fislage, what would you like to add from your side? I would like to add more, uh, two points. Actually, the first one is that I'm not a big fan of taking over any position from populism, from populists. I think in the long run, as René, I totally agree with him, in the long run, this is not helpful. I think we make some um, topics more socially acceptable with that, um, populist um, issues. So I'm in, as I said, I'm a big, not a big fan of in general taking over any position um, as I think this is not successful in the long run. And the last point I would like to mention, I'm, I said in the beginning that we right now see, especially in Germany, that the populism, populists are not so successful, but nevertheless, I would like to warn to underestimate the political movements that we have not only in Germany, but also in Europe and worldwide. And so um, I think we really have to pay attention to the developments and um, do not underestimate them, even though they are not so um, present this, uh, at this moment. Thank you very much also for the discussion. Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Fislag. And thank you, Rene Ruperos, for your contributions today. And um, many thanks also to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung with whom we were doing this year together. And uh, so thanks to Dr. Astri and Herr Gläser in Brussels. Uh, but uh, the, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung is a co-host, but also a co-participant as we have had uh, office lage here today. So full swing. And uh, perhaps only three comments uh, at the end of our webinar. Um, you just said, Frau Fislage, we shouldn't underestimate. Yes, right, don't underestimate. And I think in the beginning, René was making a strong point of uh, the state of play of our societies, the polarization and the issue of those, what you call, René, the left behind. And I think that is an important part. And that is an important part also, or role for our political system, for our political parties to make sure that the left behind are perhaps uh, in the future taken on board and not just left behind. I think that's the only way you said, uh, Frau Fischlager, stop populism, that, that is it. Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree that is the goal. And uh, I think one important aspect of that is to make sure that the left behind are no longer just the left behind. And also I think um, there is a certain need on, on, on the part of some of them that they think or that they get the feeling that their voice is being heard, that you hear a lot when you have this storm, I think it's called shit storm, I, I, I don't like that word too much, but that is how it is called. Many times when you see these, um, yeah, this uh, going overboard in these discussions, you sometimes get this reaction from some of them that you know, we don't think we have a voice, we don't think we have, uh, we are being heard, etc. So that is 
Also, you, you mentioned the migration point, and I think, uh, René, the migration point very much hits also the identity point, uh, mm -hmm. the so-called cultural identity. So don't underestimate it, but at the same time, I believe, and that's something Frau Fischlager also said in the beginning, that some of our parties really have taken some lessons and that they uh, started to really deal with this issue. They have also some internal debates, especially in that family, whether or not you take on board some of those uh, uh, considerations or you rather fend them off. That is an important debate. I think that uh, is a debate uh, we have uh, all over Europe. Um, I think it was also important what you just said uh, a moment ago, René, that uh, when we look at this issue, uh, that there is uh, back and forth in, 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 in how the impact actually works between our debates here and what is happening in the US and whether what is happening in the US is being used by others uh, to make sure that the transatlantic relations uh, look a little bit more sober. I think that is a fair point. Um, I think we'll be knowing more about the state of play in the transatlantic relations after the November <laughs> elections, I think. So only then will we be able to, to really uh, have a, a, a more uh, educated uh, look into the future. Also, many thanks to, to those who were following our debate uh, and were putting forward uh, questions either on YouTube in the chat function or by email. I, I hope we, we were able to, to catch some of the more relevant one, uh, but the time is limited. So at this point in time, I think I need to close. And I thank everybody again, specifically the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, let the two in Brussels come into the picture one more time so we can wave them off. <laughs> Brüssel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. And now to everybody, have a good day and bye bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye. Good. Cheers. So it's